It is, uh, Ibn Arabi is a writer who is, uh, as you might know if you have uh, tried to read him, not so easily accessible uh, on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, the Orientalistic uh, tradition uh, has neglected uh, Ibn Arabi to a certain degree um, until only recently, until the middle of the 20th century. Um, as you might know, Goethe, the famous German writer, uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe, has um, has been infatuated with uh, the poetry of Hafiz. Mm. And in that context, he also read and studied uh, some other um, Muslim poets of the Middle Ages, uh, especially Farsi poets. Of course, Goethe himself did not speak Farsi. He uh, he learned the script, so he could like identify some some sentences or some some words, but he didn't really speak Arabic. He read a translation of one of the early um, German Austrian Orientalists called Hama Puxtal in the uh, in the beginning of the nineteenth century. So um, for the German, for the general educated German public, uh, Arabic or let's say Muslim poetry, especially Farsi poetry, and in so far as you could count uh, half is among uh, Sufi poetry. This is up to debate, but you could say so to a certain degree, I think. Um, you could say that the general German public uh, appreciates uh, this poetry, but doesn't know much about it. So they appreciate it by um, appreciating Goethe, you know, which is regarded, who is regarded as the most important uh, German writer. So he is the kind of mediator between the general German public and um, the conception of the educated German public concerning uh, Muslim poetry. And this, of course, is not sufficient. It's not sufficient, especially not in the 21st century. And um, so uh, what I did, how I started off as a translator, because this is part of the story, part of also of my translation, is I started off meeting uh, contemporary Arab poets. They were ma mainly, mostly Iraqis, uh, in the 90s, they had come to Germany in the 80s, uh, escaping or fleeing away from the uh, from Saddam Hussein's Iraq and from the Iranian Iranian uh, Iraqi war. So they came like now. The you have the Syrian uh, refugees in Germany. At that time came the Iraqi refugees. Of course, not so many, but still there were a lot of them. And uh, there were also, as we have them now among the Syrians, there were also writers. There were writers and poets. And I became friends with those poets, having just started to learn some Arabic. And we started to translate their poetry. And this was the modernist poetry, uh, even surrealist poetry, uh, avant-garde poetry. But it was interesting because it was really what was written right now in the Arab world. So I became acquainted to the Arab, to, to, to a living literary scene in the Arabic world. And then we, we translated it and we discovered, well, now we translate this very modern stuff. And then you have this old Orientalist stuff, which was translated by the contemporaries of Goethe up to Annemarie Schimmel to a certain degree, who also translated a lot of uh, mostly classical or early modern uh, uh, Muslim poetry like uh, Iqbal, for example, you know, and um, and we discovered that, well, uh, uh, now we translate these contemporary poets, but uh, everything in between, you know, there's nothing else uh, available for the German reader. You have no chance even to read uh, the classical modern poetry, even to read like uh, famous poets like Mahmoud Tarvish or Nizar Kabani, as you have mentioned, or Adonis, they were all not present. So this was the next step to tackle those, to translate those modern, modern uh, 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 Arabic uh, writers and, and poets. And we did so. And then, and now I come back to Ibn Arabi. The fascinating thing is most of these, uh, most of these writers, like take, take just the example of Mahmoud Tarvish and, and Adonis, they are secular writers. They are, they don't, they are not, I don't know if they believe or not, but they are not believers in the classical sense. They, they, I think they don't go to pray and so on. So, um, uh, and they say so in their poetry. I mean, they're quite explicit about their themselves being secular, but nonetheless, and this is the most, this was, this fascinated me from the very beginning. Nonetheless, they appreciate very much uh, Muslim Sufi poetry, you know, from the Middle Ages, you know. For example, Adonis, 
um, has written a book called Assyria was Sufia, or Sufia was Surrealia, meaning Sufism and Surrealism. So he compared two, uh, two trends or two uh, ideas, Surrealism and Sufism, which you would never bring together usually. But he did so, and he discovered that there are a lot of similarities between Surrealism, as it has been developed in France, uh, you you know, of course, the surrealist painting like by Dali, you know, or uh, surrealist poetry by Eluard, uh, Breton and others. So this is a well-known uh, um, trend in the arts and in literature. And uh, it has been taken up by Arab poets like Adonis and many others. And he compared this to the Sufi way of expressing themselves, of seeing the world and so on. And he said, well, it's quite comparable. There might be even, um, there might be even a, a, a hidden relationship, you know, and especially André Breton, who is one of the, uh, let's say the ideologues or the, the, the thinkers of surrealism. He was, um, he was infatuated with anything we might, we would call now esoteric, you know, uh, he kind of liked it. It's, it's very difficult to find out exactly what he meant, but he was infatuated by esoteric thought like Sufism or um, even uh, art, non-European art. There is, if you have the chance to go to per Paris, go to the, um, uh, go to the uh, Centre Georges Pompidou in the center of Paris, a big, uh, it's a library, but it's also a big exhibition hall, a museum. And there you find a room, it's like this, imagine this room where I'm sitting here. And, um, and this is the living room of André Breton. And it is full of African masks, of uh, like Asian uh, stone carvings, of uh, maybe a kashkul by a Sufi, and full of stuff. It's it's like a museum, you know. This is where he lived and what he thought. And so you can easily see there is you can have a bridge between those secularized thinkers like Adonis or even André Breton and Sufism. So this is very important. Um, to, to, to show you the larger context. It's very important because uh, usually, especially we in the West, uh, we regard the, uh, the Muslims or even the believers because like uh, modern societies like the German society, like French or English, they're, they're deeply secularized, you know? Uh, you, of course, you have churches and people go there, but it's not really a, a believing society. So um, we always say that there is, well, Okay, there we know that there are believers, but most of them, most of us are not. Or if we are, we are in a more modern way than the others. And so for the general conception of the world, from the Western perspective, there's a sharp split between secularized societies and believing societies or religious societies or societies where you have a majority of believers and where this belief still shapes the um the society in large and even politics from time to time. So um, there's a gap, there's a, there's, a, there's a rift between these people. And this rift is also a rift between, or in Germany itself, in so far as you have now many people from the Muslim world coming, Im immigrating into Germany, like the Syrian refugees. Of course, not all of them are believers, but many of them are. And, um, and so they are perceived as a foreign element, in a way, and as an element which is for some people, especially from the right wing and nationalist spectrum of the political sphere, they are regarded as a threat. So, um, so for me, it is fascinating to see that if you have, uh, if you have the Arab, even contemporary Arab secularist thinkers, for them, there's a, you can, you can, you can build a bridge. You can build a bridge to the other system, to the believing system, to the other. It's not two completely uh, separate worlds, you know. There's a, it's possible to combine them or, um, yes, to, 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 to make them one or to think them as one. And I think this is very important if we, um, if we try, to, um, try to, to, to have an integral view of society to see that such a thing is possible. So, um, and then I started to read, of course, Ibn Arabi, and um, I found that 
the the best way to introduce Ibn Arabi to the German public would be to um, to start with a collection of poetry of his, because I was also trained as a translator of poetry. So I decided for the Tarjuma and Al Ashwaq, which is, as I already had said, uh, one of the most important uh, volumes of medieval Arabic Sufi poetry or poetry as such. Ahbabu qalbi aynahum bilahi. قولوا أينهم كما رأيت تيفهم فهل تريني عينهم فكم وكم أطلبهم وكم سألت بينهم حتى أمنت بينهم وما أمنت بينهم لعل سادي حائل بيننا وبينهم لتنعم العين بهم فلا أقول أينهم wo sind sie, unsere Lieben? Sagt bei Gott, wo sind sie hin? Willst du mir ihre Wesen zeigen, so wie ich ihre Schemen sah? So oft, so oft verlange ich sie, dass ich bei ihnen bleiben darf, bis ich vor Trennung sicher bin und doch zugleich nie sicher bin. Vielleicht gelingt es meinem Glück, ihr Wegsein aus dem Dasein auszuweisen, auf dass das Auge sich an ihnen freuen darf und ich nicht frag, wo sind sie denn? The loved ones of my heart, where are they? Say by God, where are they? As thou sawest their apparition, wilt thou show to me their reality? How long, how long was I seeking them? And how often did I beg to be united with them? until I had no fear of being parted from them, and yet I feared to be amongst them. Perchance my happy star will hinder their going, their going afar from me, that mine eye may be blessed with them, and that I may not ask, where are they? Thank you.